in the last video, we figured out that if we had a proton coming in to the right at a velocity of 6 times 10 to the 7th meters per second, so the magnitude of the velocity is 1 fifth the speed of light, and if it were to cross this magnetic field, we used this formula to figure out that the magnitude of the force on this prote proton, not protein, would be 4.8 times 10 to the negative 12 newtons. And in the direction, we used our right hand rule, because this was a cross product. And we figured out that it would be perpendicular. Well, it has to be perpendicular to both, because we're taking the cross product. And right when it enters, the net force will be downwards. But then as, think about what happens. If you have a downward force right there, then the particle will be deflected downward a little bit. So its velocity vector will then look something like that. But it's still in the magnetic field, right? And not only is it still in the magnetic field, but since the particle is still moving within the plane of your video screen, it's still completely perpendicular to the magnetic field. And so the, chi the, the magnitude of the force on the moving particle won't change, just the direction will, right? Because the, the, if we do the right hand rule here, but if we just move our hand down a little bit, if we tilt it down, then our thumb's going to be pointing in this direction. And that just keeps happening. It gets deflected that way a little bit. So the magnitude of the velocity doesn't ever change. It always stays perpendicular to the magnetic field, because it's always staying in this plane. But the orientation does change within the plane. And because of that, because the orientation of velocity changes, the orientation of the force changes. So when the velocity is here, the force is perpendicular. So it acts as kind of a centripetal force. And so the particle will start moving in a circle. So let's see if we can break out our toolkit from what we've learned before in classical mechanics and figure out what the radius of that circle is. And that might seem more daunting than it really is. Well, what do we know about centripetal forces and radiuses of circles, et cetera? Well, let me make some space first. Let's see, I probably don't need this. I don't even need the first few of these field lines. Um, let's see. Well, I'll leave everything else. I'll get rid of that field line. That should give us enough space. I'll try to write small, but le legibly. So what is the formula for centripetal force? And we prove it many, many videos ago, early in the physics playlist. Well, centripetal acceleration is the magnitude of the velocity vector squared over the radius of the circle. And since this is acceleration, if we want to know the centripetal force, it's just the mass times acceleration. So it's the mass of the particle or the object in question times the magnitude of its velocity squared divided by the radius of the circle. In this case, this is the radius of the circle. And that's what we're going to try to solve for. And what do we know about the centripetal force? What is causing the centripetal force? Well, it's the magnetic field. And we figured that out, right? This is going to be equal to this, which we figured out is going to be equal to at least the magnitudes. The magnitude of this is equal to the magnitude of this. And that the magnitude is 4.8 times 10 to the minus 12th newtons. And so the radius is going to be, let's see, if we flip both sides of this equation, we get radius over mass velocity squared is equal to 1 over 4.8 times 10 to the minus 12. I could just figure out what that number is, but I won't worry about it right now. And then we can multiply both sides times this, times this mv squared. And we get that the radius of this circle is going to be equal to the mass of the proton times its, the magnitude of its velocity squared, the magnitude of its velocity squared, divided by the force uh, from the magnetic field, the centripetal force. 4.8 times 10 to the minus 12 newtons. And the radius should be in meters, since everything is kind of in the standard SI units. And let's see if we can figure this out. Get our calculator. And this is where that constant uh, function is useful again. Because what is the mass of a proton? Well, that's something that I personally don't have memorized. But if we go into the built-in constants on the TI-85, let's see, more. Mass of a proton. This is mass of an electron. Let me scoot it over a little bit. This is mass of an electron. This is mass of a proton. So mass of a proton, that's what we care about, times the magnitude of the velocity squared. What was the velocity? It was 6 times 10 to the 7th meters per second. So times 6 times 10 to the 7th 
meters per second squared, right? Because I have to take them, and then all of that divided by all of that divided by the magnitude of the centripetal force, which is the force that's being generated by the magnetic field. That's 4.8 times 10 to the negative 12. So divided by 4.8 e minus 12. And let's see. Hopefully we don't get something funky. There we go. And that's actually a pretty neat number. 1.25 meters. That's actually kind of a, a number that we can imagine. So if you have a a proton going through a, in going in this direction at 6 at 1 fifth the speed of light through a what did I say it was it was a 0.5 tesla magnetic field where the vectors are pointing out of the video we have just shown that this proton will go in a circle of radius 1.25 meters which is neat cuz it's a number that I can actually visualize and so this this whole business of magnetic fields making charged particles go into circles, this is one of the few times that I can actually say has a direct application into some things, into things that you've seen, namely your TV or at least the the old school TVs and the non uh, plasma or LCD TVs, your cathode ray TVs take advantage of this, where you essentially have a beam of not protons but electrons, that, and a magnet, if you take apart a TV, which I don't think you should do because you're more likely to hurt yourself because there's a vacuum in there that can implode and all of that. But essentially, you have a magnet that deflects the, this electron beam and does it really fast so it scans your entire screen of different intensities, and that's what forms the image. I won't go into that detail. Maybe one day I'll do a whole video on how TVs work. So that's one application of a magnetic field causing a beam of charged particles to curve. And then the other application, this is actually one where it's actually useful to make the particle go in a circle, is these cyclotrons that you read about, where they take these protons and they make them go in circles really, really fast, and then they smash them together. Well, how, have you ever wondered, how do they even make a proton go in a circle? It's not like you can hold it and you know guide it around a circle. Well, that's what they do. They pass it through an appropriate uh, uh, strength magnetic field, and it curves the path of the proton so that it can keep going through the same field over and over again. And, and then they can use those, you know, then they can actually use um, uh, electric fields. I don't know, I don't claim to have any expertise in this, but then they can keep speeding it up using the same devices because it keeps passing through the same part of the, uh, through the, of the, of the, of the collider. And then once it collides, you've probably seen those pictures. Those pictures. Right, you know, you spend billions of dollars on super colliders, and you end up with these pictures. And somehow, these physicists are able to take these pictures and say, "Oh, this is some new particle because of the way it moved." Well, actually, what they're actually talking about is, you know, these are moving at relativistic speeds, and since they're at relativistic speeds, as they move at different velocities, their mass is changing, all of that. But the the basic the basic idea is what we just learned. They move in circles. They move in circles because they're going through a magnetic field, but they go, they, their radiuses are different because their charges and their velocities are going to be different. And, and actually some will move to the, you know, left, some will move to the right, and that might be because, because they're positive or negative, or, you know, and then the radius will be dependent on their masses. Anyway, I don't want to confuse you, but I just want to show you that we actually are touching on some physics that a physicist would actually care about. Now with that said, what would have happened what would have happened if this wasn't a proton, but if this was an electron moving at this velocity at 6 times 10 to the 7th meters per second through a 0.5 Tesla magnetic field popping out of this video? What would have happened? Well, this formula would have still been the same. The magnitude of the force is the charge. But it wouldn't be the charge of the proton. It would be the charge of an electron times 6 times 10 to the 7th meters per second times 0.5 Teslas. So what's the difference between the charge of a proton and the charge of an electron? Well, the charge of an electron is negative. So if this was an electron, then the net force would actually end up being a negative number. So what does that mean? Well, when we use the right-hand rule with the proton example, we said that the at least when the pro, when the proton is moving in this direction, that the net force would be downwards, right? But now all of a sudden, if we reverse the charge, if we say we have a negative charge, it's the same magnitude, but it's negative because it's an electron, what happens? We're now The force is now in this direction, using the right-hand rule, but it is negative. So really, it's going to be a positive force of the same magnitude in this direction. So if we have a proton, it'll go in a circle in this direction. It'll go like this. But if we have an electron, it'll go in a circle of the other direction. 
And I'll let me ask you a question. Is that circle going to be a tighter circle or a, or a wider circle? Well, the mass of an electron is a lot smaller than the mass of a proton. And we had the radius is equal to the mass times the velocity squared divided by the centripetal force. So if this mass is smaller, the radius is going to be smaller. So the electron's path would actually it would move up, and it would be a smaller radius. Actually, proportional to the difference, the, the differences in the radiuses are is the the difference in their masses actually, but that would be the path of the electron. Anyway, I thought you would be interested in in that as well. I have run out of time. I will see you in the next video.